Um, I contend that Edward Drummond Libby is probably the most important person in Toledo's history. His impact was on industry, it was on the social service agencies, it was on the arts scene. I mean, his, his influence was everywhere. He was born in Chelsea, Massachusetts in 1854. He wanted to be a minister. He went to boarding school like most uh, men of the, young men of the time did. Um, but he, his dream of being a minister was not to be. Um, in 1877, his father, William Libby, took over the New England Glass Company, the, one of the oldest glass manufacturers in the country. Um, and it was a, a difficult time for the New England Glass Company. It had been founded in 1818, so this makes this year the 200th anniversary of what would become Libby Glass. Um, it was fallen on hard times, um, but William Libby was determined. He had been working in the glass most of his life. He was determined to try to make this a success. So he took over the company, and just about that time, there was a major economic recession. Um, and unfortunately, the company was really struggling. So much so that it took Mr. Libby's life, the uh, older Libby's life. He uh, died suddenly, and that left the company to his son, who, as I said, really had no interest in being a glass man. He wanted to be a minister, but because of his father's sudden death, there's a beautifully eloquent comment that he made in his batch book. You know, all glass men kept a batch book where they would put their formulas for glass. And he wrote down on that day that his father died that. You know, it was really his responsibility to take over this company and to, you know, continue his father's legacy. So, took over the New England Glass Company, which was in Cambridge, Massachusetts, uh, after his father's death, and continued to struggle and continued to struggle. Um, it was very expensive to produce glass in New England because you had to bring in your energy source, coal, which was very expensive. The workers were unionized and demanding high wages. And they were competing then against new manufacturers in Pennsylvania and West Virginia who had closer uh, connections to the coal fields and could produce the glass much cheaper. So the co companies on the East Coast were struggling. The city of Toledo, city fathers were looking for something, some kind of industry to really set the path for the city. They had discovered what they thought was a major deposit of natural gas under the city, which was not actually true. Um, but using that, they went out and tried to market Toledo to the industries that might make use of that. So they went to Mr. Libby and said, how about if we give you some money and some land for a factory and you can move that New England Glass Company to Toledo. So in 1888, that's what Libby did. He loaded up his machinery, he loaded up all the men who wanted to come, came by train, arrived in Toledo. There was a huge celebration for him. And unfortunately, it took a while for his factory to sort of get going. And as Ted mentioned, the 1893 World's Fair was very important because it was kind of the turning point for Mr. Libby's operation. It was barely succeeding. He had to borrow $250,000 to build that pavilion at the World's Fair. And so he was in debt, but the, the, the World's Fair pavilion was so successful that he came out of there with $100,000. So he was able to plow that back into his factory. The first thing he did, he teamed up with Michael Owens, a young man from West Virginia who had literally almost no education, but had been working the glass factory since he was 10 years old. And between the two of them, they came up with a machine to automatically produce a glass bottle, the very first one ever invented, the Owens bottle machine. And that started a new company. So we have the Libby Glass Company over here. Mr. Libby and Mr. Owens come together to make the um, Owens Bottle Machine Company. In 1929, that company merged with the Illinois Glass Company, Vault in Illinois, and became Owens, Illinois. At the same time, um, they began experimenting with glass fibers. And one of the things they discovered that was during Prohibition, nobody was buying glass bottles because you weren't bottling any liquor. So they had to do something with glass machines, so they figured out a way to make glass fibers. And that became another company. That became Owens Corning Fiberglass. And then Mr. Libby and Mr. Owens also went together and started producing flat glass in a new technique called the Colburn process, which they perfected. And in 1929, that company merged with the Ford plate glass company in Rossford and became Libby Owens Ford. So Mr. Libby is single-handedly responsible, along with his <laughs> connections with Mr. Owens, for four international corporations, all of them headquartered here in Toledo. So, where, you know, he's truly an amazing man. When he died, his estate was worth $35 million. <coughs> Did 
Today, $1 million is equal to $14 million. So imagine how much money that was, and they had no surviving children. Florence was very interested in art, and she got Mr. Libby uh, interested in art. This was her father's land, Maurice Scott. He was the son of Jessup W. Scott, one of another incredibly important person in Toledo's history. And that when they decided to build an art museum, that's the property that Florence gave for it. So this whole area was actually Florence's property. But, um, it, you know, it's, it's just lovely to look out, you know, yeah. and, and, and look at the museum. So. <laughs> Anybody have any questions? Does well, it, let's go inside. Does anybody live in the house now? No. It's, as I say, it's a private, or a private nonprofit 501c3 foundation. Yeah.